Hey friends, today I thought I'd talk about an unfortunate paper, one that was published several weeks ago and that I was reluctant to contribute to its promotion. I waited quietly, I was busy anyway, to see what would happen to it. And aside from an early flurry of attempts at self-promotion by its authors and fellow travelers, it seems to have fallen into the obscurity it deserves. It's a really terrible paper. It's safe for me to tear it into it then. The paper is titled In Defense of Merit in Science, published in something called the Journal of Controversial Ideas. I had no idea that merit needed defending, or was it all controversial, but it has 29 authors, some of whom have significant prestige. Others are nothing but intellectual dark web sort of cranks, and all of them would not be at all out of place on the fake University of Austin faculty. It's an expansion of the grievance studies nonsense, and Bogosian is one of its authors, while Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay are cited. And if the authors are not on the staff of the University of Austin, at least some of them are publishing opinion pieces in Quillette. Basically, it's a collection of right-wing ideologues complaining about ideology, unaware that it's ideology all the way down. The primary author is a chemist from USC named Anna Kryloff, so I'm going to refer to it as the Kryloff paper, even though it has a swarm of hangers-on, all listed in alphabetical order as a testimonial to their agreement with its thesis. They really should all be equally embarrassed. To make it manageable, I've broken up this video into three pieces. Uh, first, I'll just take a look at the claims of the paper. Is it true that the social justice warriors are taking over and destroying science? Secondly, I'll offer my personal perspective as a social justice advocate and a professor at one of those liberal arts schools. Are we actually trying to oppose Western science and the principle of merit? And finally, I'll get a bit meta and ask, is the paper in defense of merit and science actually meritorious by any objective criterion? So let's plunge into the paper. Unfortunately, it's all resentment and lies. It's just, it really is a terrible paper. Uh, we'll start with the abstract, which has a few problems. So the abstract says, merit is a central pillar of liberal epistemology, humanism, and democracy. Nice that they're on the side of those things. Uh, the scientific enterprise built on merit has proven effective in generating scientific and technological advances, reducing suffering, and narrowing social gaps, and improving the quality of life globally. This perspective documents the ongoing attempts to undermine the core principles of liberal epistemology and to replace merit with non-scientific, politically motivated criteria. We explain the physical origins of this conflict— they don't, actually, document the intrusion of ideology into our scientific institutions. Uh, they don't demonstrate that at all. Discuss the perils of abandoning merit. Uh, no one has suggested abandoning merit. And offer an alternative human-centered approach to address existing social inequalities. Uh, they've, got, they've got some silly stuff at the very end, but it's uh, not going to do the job. The first big problem, the one that plagues this whole paper, is not is that merit isn't actually defined, nor do they discuss how we should recognize and measure merit, which is the crux of the issue. More serious people recognize that measuring merit is complex and difficult. Their whole argument is a kind of naive utilitarianism. If something generates scientific advances and reduces suffering, then it has, by definition, merit. There is and will be no consideration of conflicts in those goals. Sometimes technological advances will increase social gaps or reduce the quality of life for at least some people. If science and technology make a small proportion of the population incredibly wealthy at the cost of impoverishing everyone else, is that merit? The calculus isn't as simple as they think. The second big problem is their biased mischaracterization of anyone who disagrees with their simplistic argument. You see, if you point out the internal conflicts with their ideas and suggest 
different priorities for society, then you want to replace merit with non-scientific, politically motivated criteria. There is no middle ground. You either agree with their priorities wholeheartedly or you hate merit and science and democracy and want to reduce our quality of life. Have they considered the possibility that people may have different ideals and value other approaches to improving the world? That balance is also a consideration? The introduction does not improve on the abstract. It has the same glib superficiality. It's the kind of thing where you think for a moment that it sounds good. Of course, I value science and merit and democracy and making people happy and safe. Uh, but when you think about it, you realize they've resolved nothing and are just spitting out buzzwords. For instance, it starts with a volley of pinkerisms. It literally cites Pinker for this stuff, that this is the best of all worlds, that we've improved everything since ancient times. You must be grateful that you were born in this time and place and that we're living in a more just and peaceful world thanks to scientific progress. I guess it's safe to write that since a Bangladeshi garment worker, a Russian soldier in Ukraine, or a trans teenager in Missouri, or an immigrant working in a slaughterhouse are unlikely to read the paper and object. But they do acknowledge this inequity. At least. It's just that they respond with more rank scientism and remarkable obliviousness. Of of course, serious problems continue to challenge us. Poverty, inequality, wars, and violence persist. Climate change, biodiversity loss, antimicrobial resistance, and pandemic disease threaten global gains made over the past century. However, since science continues to be the best tool humanity possesses to address these complex collective challenges, indeed, science holds the key to solving these problems. It provides a basis for renewable energy technologies, mitigating anthropogenic impact on the global climate, feeding the world's growing population, controlling pandemics, and eradicating debilitating diseases. Well, isn't that nice? So, science continues to be the best tool, but in many cases it isn't. The best tools are often sociological if we want to reduce global climate change, we aren't going to science our way out of it. We need to change our consumption habits. We have to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. We need to eat less meat. We have to stop stripping the ocean floor of sea life. Technology is part of the solution, but not the whole of it. <clears throat> then to bring up the eradication of diseases. We recently went through this, remember? Millions died. People are still dying. Developing a vaccine was essential, but so many people refused to accept basic behavioral changes like masking, and many still refuse to take advantage of that scientific solution, the vaccine. Again, it's not as simple as they want you to believe. Okay, they make a token acknowledgement of that fact. They say, of course, science alone is not sufficient. Science is but a tool that can be used for good and bad. It is our responsibility as a society to use it responsibly, ethically, and effectively. Oh, boy. Okay, so ethics matters. We're bringing philosophy into this now. We're supposed to be defending scientific merit, which we're pretending is some quantifiable metric we can apply to the solution for any problem. But now we have to incorporate values into it? Sounds like those fuzzy social justice concerns might have some relevance after all. Don't worry, though. It's only a momentary flash of introspection. It's quickly cast aside as they identify the true enemies of reason and science and merit. It's identity politics. So, fulfilling this responsibility, however, is being hindered by a new alarming clash between liberal epistemology and identity-based ideologies. Liberal epistemology prizes free and open inquiry, values vigorous discourse and debate, and determines the best scientific ideas by separating those that are true from those that are likely not. The statuses, identities, and demographics of scientists are irrelevant 
to this great sifting of valid versus invalid ideas. I love the idea that statuses, identities, and demographics shouldn't matter. Unfortunately, that horse got out of the barn long ago, and it's convenient that now, long after statuses, identities, and demographics have established dominion over the sciences, now we're finally going to turn a blind eye to long-established biases. That sifting they idealize doesn't often happen with extant scientists deciding that we shouldn't disturb the status quo by bringing up how often invalid ideas have been accepted. Case in point, Anna Krylov and her cronies. It's a bad sign when your defense of unbiased, valid ideas has to resort to bogus canards to make your point. But that's exactly what this paper does. For example... They say, although there are feminist critiques of how glaciologists have conducted, although there are feminist critiques of how glaciologists have conducted themselves, there is no such thing as feminist glaciology. Just as there is no queer chemistry, Jewish physics, white mathematics, indigenous science, or feminist astronomy, glacial, physical, genetic, or prehistoric phenomena are independent of the positionality of the science. By prioritizing the truth value of scientific research personal influences of individual scientists are minimized. But of course there is a feminist glaciology. These ple people clearly haven't read the paper they're criticizing. They're just, they're just upset at the terminology that was used because that paper does make a valid point. I'll quote Mark Carey, one of the authors who, who had to defend his work in the journal Science because so many ill-informed yahoos were raising a ruckus about it. He says, if one goal of glacier research is to help the people living in places like the Alps and Alaska adapt to shrinking glaciers and the associated floods, landslides, and seasonal variation in water flows for irrigation and hydroelectricity generation, then it is important to study more than the physical properties of ice. Social scientists like myself work to understand those complex societies, their politics and economies, their cultures, and yes, their gender relations because patriarchy and sexism marginalize certain segments of the population, just as racism marginalizes indigenous, Latino, and other peoples. Okay, that's, that's a good point. I remind you that the authors of the Krylov paper said... Science alone is not sufficient. Science is but a tool that can be used for good and bad. And here we see people who are taking into account the experiences of the people and communities who live in the shadow of glaciers are prioritizing a significant aspect of the truth. But it is a team of resentful ideologues who want to hide the complexity of the issues and resort to the mantra of ice is ice and turn glaciology into nothing but a physics problem. It is in significant part, but the whole is much greater. They don't seem to be able to read anything on these subjects with comprehension. One of their frequent claims is that the goal of critical social justice, CSJ, is to do destroy everything, not just science, but art and law. You don't believe me? They make this claim multiple times in the paper. The CSJ view that institutions of knowledge, art, and law perpetuate systemic racism and therefore must be dismantled, and that merit-based criteria in hiring, publishing, and funding must be replaced with CSJ criteria, has been aggressively advanced by many of our academic leadership. No, it hasn't, but okay, go on. University administrators, executive bodies, of professional societies, publishers, etc., a search for racism in the titles of papers published by the Science and Nature Publishing Groups returns hundreds of hits, such as NIH Apologizes for Structural Racism, Pledges Change, Dismantling Systemic Racism in Science, and Systemic Racism in Higher Education. This reflects the axiomatic ideological perspective of CSJ that systemic racism is indelibly etched into every Western institution. The perspective is taken as an article of faith, which is why some have argued that CSJ 
Wait, who's the some? Tell me what some have argued this. But they've argued that CSJ is more a secular religion than an evidence-based science. Oh boy. Okay. So something that jumped out at me is that you may notice this, this claim that CSJ wants to dismantle institutions of knowledge, but it's unreferenced. I would at least expect a quote from some radical social justice weirdo that they aim to take all of science apart, but they don't have it. Instead, they dig up criticisms of racism in the titles of scientific papers in prominent journals. Okay, does anybody else notice the disconnection there? So on one hand, they're claiming that we're trying to dismantle all of science, uh, but then what they do to back that up is they look at scientific papers and discover that they talk about racism. And somehow that is the same as claiming that they want to destroy all of science. So this is how they justify that claim, by discovering that many scientists study and oppose racism. Is racism one of the scientific truths that they believe have merit? Are we to seriously believe that Science Magazine, Nature Magazine, and the National Institutes of Health, some of the biggest scientific institutions in the world, are arguing that they should dismantle themselves? This is rank nonsense. And as we'll see, they have to distort and lie about the contents of the papers that they do cite to make their case. They do this repeatedly. They claim that science, it's been infected by the humanities. Like, we've got humanities cooties now. So, they say, for decades, critical theories have been confined to humanities and studies department of universities. But the ideas has spread to other disciplines and the outside world, which is what should happen, right? If you've got good ideas, let them spread where they have been picked up by activists in the press. Following the canons of CSJ, science is described as white and colonial, and here we go, therefore should be dismantled. These ideas now routinely appear in some of the most influential scientific journals without citation to actual data supporting their claims. There's real irony there. The Apex Journal Nature has created a decolonizing science tool toolkit, which includes articles such as institutions must acknowledge the racist roots in science. Decolonization should extend to collaborations, authorship, and co-creation of knowledge, and seeding an anti-racist culture at Scotland's botanical gardens. You see the pattern, right? First claim that CSJ is about dismantling science and then follow up with a flurry of titles of science articles that mention racism and colonialism as if that's sufficient to demonstrate the point. Again, I must ask, where are these canons of CSJ claiming that science should be dismantled? They aren't listed in the references at the end of the paper. Instead, we got a collection of papers from the journal Nature which, I promise you, isn't planning to deconstruct itself any time in the foreseeable future, that talk about the historical racism that is unquestionably present in science, that argues that colonial exploitation of indigenous peoples existed and continues to exist, and that the botanical collections in the British Museum were the result of unacknowledged contributions from talented native peoples. So tell me, what is wrong with that? The paper sure doesn't explain. It's just paranoia and indignant histrionics about how including historical context does great harm to science somehow. Reading this paper overall gives the impression that they really, really want everyone to shut up about racism. We should sweep it under the rug. We need to pretend that history and culture have never influenced science. Colonialism is good, don't you know? One other small point. They constantly refer to social justice as CSJ or critical social justice. This is a conceit that seems to have been popularized by the grievance study people. They, they notice that the term critical race theory was effectively demonized by right-wing propaganda. So sure, let's stick the word critical in front of everything we don't like. It's mildly annoying. 
I don't like clowns. I should start calling them critical clowns. Anyway, I could go through this paragraph, paragraph by paragraph and see the biases exposed. But in the interest of giving their argument a fair shake, I'm going to skip ahead past a lot of garbage to a whole section on page 16 in which they make a somewhat more specific claim that CSJs think merit-based policies should be replaced by identity-based policies. As you might predict, they don't actually support that idea. At best, these CSJ sources can argue that identity should be one factor in addition to merit in rewarding scientific contributions. So Kryloff and others say, major scientific journals such as Nature, Science, and their sister publications regularly publish editorials and letters to the editor calling for increasing the number of women and selected minorities among tenure-track faculty, graduate students, award recipients, conference speakers, and editorial boards. In response, scientific institutions have begun implementing identity-based practices in social engineering. Okay, what's the objection? Should we not increase the number of women in selected minorities in science? Is that what they're complaining about? Because they're not going to back that up. Either. They're not even going to come out and boldly state that we ought to keep the brown people out. So he continues, some faculty hiring committees are prioritizing diversity over merit or even using ideology as a filter by, for example, eliminating candidates solely based on DEI statements. Okay, this, this is actually true in part, but it's a matter of selective interpretation and selective quoting. We do want to, to foster diversity. But no, it doesn't override merit and quality of faculty. That's the balancing act we got to perform. We got to evaluate all these candidates for jobs, for instance. And we have to take into account that some of them have been discriminated against in the past and try and assess the, their ability to do science against that kind of background of bias and prejudice that exists everywhere. For example, when we at my university are doing a job search, we include this little bit of boilerplate in our ads. So we say, Morris values diversity in its students, faculty, and staff. Morris is especially interested in qualified candidates who can contribute to the diversity of our community through their teaching, research, and our service, because we believe that diversity enriches the university experience for everyone. Okay, do, do you get it? That What's most important, our primary criterion, are is their quality of their teaching, research, and service. That's number one. But we sure would like to increase the diversity of our faculty population, for instance. And so we're going to be looking for candidates who help us with that. But it's not going to be the ultimate final cr criterion for admission to the university. And so, yeah, we're, you could say that's, that's identity-based, but it's not a very effective identity-based. It just means we're trying to encourage more people to apply so that we have a wider pool of people so that we can select among them for the highest qualities. So we also have members of our search committees go through training to recognize implicit bias. When we are reviewing applications, our choices are subject to review by the administration, so they'll ask things like, did our final candidates reflect the distribution of applicants in the pool? So we have a whole bunch of science-based procedures to prevent our biases from influencing our selection of the best people for the job because we all have those biases. We should be familiar with this as science, that one of the things we're doing with the, the methodology of science is to try and prevent ourselves from fooling ourselves. And it's the same when we're reviewing job candidates. So we also expect diversity, equity, and inclusion statements because faculty at our university, but perhaps not at the University of Austin, are expected to work collegially with diverse colleagues and students. We might even eliminate candidates solely based on their DEI statements. 
After all, we wouldn't be able to assess them if they didn't write one. And if their statement was something along the lines of, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children, then yeah, we are not going to hire them. They are right out. Do the Krylov people think we ought to employ white nationalists or something? I think the answer would be yes, because there's also a subtext here that has to be addressed. Here's an example. They, they dislike affirmative action, among many other things, but they don't really make a good argument against it. So they say that some form of affirmative action might be effective in college admissions when students do not yet possess demonstrated credentials and many have lacked educational opportunities. That's a good concession. Okay. However, when preferential selection goes overboard, for example, when the mean scores or admission criteria of affirmative action students is a standard deviation or more below those of students admitted under conventional standards, the practice becomes counterproductive in helping underrepresented groups to advance. Um, okay, the important bit in the paragraph that I want to see backed up is the claim that it's problematic when we let in affirmative action students, that is minorities, with scores that are a standard deviation below those of other students. I would argue that admission criteria aren't the rock-solid rock scientific metrics you might imagine them to be, and are also subject to historical and cultural biases. But okay, let's see the evidence. And there's that citation number 131 which I assumed would be an example of low-scoring minority students getting in where they don't deserve. But surprise, surprise, it's from an article titled An American Crisis, The Lack of Black Men in Medicine. I can see where it would jump to the attention of the Krylov group. In the, it's in the Journal of Racial and Ethnic Health Disparities. And here's what it says. We conducted an analysis of American Association of Medical Colleges applicant and matriculation data. Our analyses compared the 1992-1993 GPA scores of white males to the 2013-2014 GPA scores of black males. The results indicated that there were no significant, significant differences in GPA scores of black males in 2013-2014 compared to white males' GPA scores decades before. That's it. It doesn't support the claims of the Krylov paper at all. This is the kind of behavior I'd expect from a creationist. They're comfortable with mangling a scientific conclusion to say the opposite of what the author intended. So these authors are saying that there were historical inequities, but they have, they have shifted over time, and we are now using a more biased selection criterion in 2013-2014. So this this is really not at all supporting their the Krylov claim that we're letting in unqualified students. It should be an embarrassment to the authors. But since it feeds on and supports their twin motivations of resentment and entitlement, they're not going to apply any kind of critical faculties to their work. But who am I to criti criticize? I'm, I'm one of the social justice warriors they despise. I am employed as a professor at exactly the kind of university they hate. And I freely admit to my position. So I'm going to take a moment and just say a little bit about my biases. Okay, I am a professor at the University of Minnesota Morris. It's a public liberal arts college with a reputation for being relatively diverse and tolerant. Uh, we've had a recent recently say that it was too diverse. Almost 20% of our student body are Native Americans, and I specifically applied to work here because it was a student-centered university with a real appreciation for the breadth of knowledge. I believe in the importance of the humanities and social sciences and, art, and arts in addition to the sciences as an essential recipe for a good education. It's a great place to work and highly appreciated by the majority of our graduates. So you might be wondering, 
how we must suffer for having to dance to the tune of critical social justice, and how dreadfully denigrated the concepts of Western science must be here, and how savagely we must downplay merit in job applications and tenure and promotion decisions. At least if you'd read the nonsense in that Krylov paper, you might think that. Here's what life is really like living under the thumb of a liberal social justice campus. We are requested to include a land acknowledgement in our syllabi and our professional presentations, and the administration even includes boilerplate text that we can use. Note the word request. We are not required to do so. But most of us are more than willing to express our debt to the Dakota peoples. This is something of a minimal token nod in their direction, so you'd have to be exceptionally mean-spirited to complain about it. The Krylov gang complains about this sort of thing. So here's this statement. It's just saying, yeah, this used to be the land of the Dakota people. Uh, our state's name comes from the Dakota name for this region. Uh, the University of Minnesota Morris was host to a Native American boarding school. And we are now a public liberal arts college. And our, we have a federal recognition as a Native American serving non-tribal institution. What that means is Native Americans get free tuition at this university. But there's a lot of history embedded in that statement. And part of being here is an awareness of what it all means. Yes, this place was founded as an Indian boarding school by the Catholic Church. I suppose it's a burden that we aren't allowed to forget that. But it's part of the truth. It wouldn't be meritorious to neglect our history. One of the buildings of that school still stands on campus. It's used as a minority resource center, ironically. Also, we are a land-grant college. That means that we are a beneficiary of the Morrill Act, a 19th century law that gave railroad tycoons an incentive to build, build rails across the wilderness in return for giving them vast tracts of land all across the American West. They also had to set aside a fraction of that to the state, which could then use the revenues to fund educational institutions. So this land was taken away from Native people, and then, curiously, the government gave it away freely to European immigrants. That word Im European seems to have been very potent in their minds. So we're a colonial institution built on the bones of the people who came before us. We have to recognize this. The funding of our college was derived from land confiscated from the Dakota people in the mid-19th century, which led to them being confined to small reservations, forcing them to give up their way of life to become farmers, kidnapping their children and sending them to boarding schools like ours, and making them reliant on the non-existent generosity of U.S. Indian agents. Uh, so, for instance, famine triggered the Dakota War of 1862, a bloody and brutal conflict on both sides. The United States of America is a profoundly racist country. We set up this war. It hurts to admit this, but part of the merit of science ought to be an ability to witness uncomfortable truths and make amends. The Dakota War ended with the defeat of the tribes at the hands of the U.S. Army. And then we got the largest mass execution in the U.S. with 38 Indians hanged at a giant gallows. Isn't technology wonderful? American ingenuity built that. The bodies of the dead were then used for medical study. The Dakota leader, Little Crow, uh, was shot by a farmer later. His body was scalped, and the scalp sent off to the Smithsonian Institution. His head was chopped off and paraded around the town of Hutchinson before being sent off to the Minnesota Historical Society. Science was not an innocent bystander. The butchered remains of the Indian dead were not returned for burial until the 1970s. And this isn't just ancient history, either. 
Uh, the University of Minnesota continues to profit from resources take f- taken from the indigenous peoples. And you can read about it in The Truth Project. I'll include a link to this down below. The Truth Project was a study made to examine the relationship between the university and the tribes of Minnesota, which found persistent systemic mistreatment of indigenous people by the University of Minnesota. Not just the general public, but the policies of the University of Minnesota. Now, the price of being on a CSJ campus is fairly minimal. Land acknowledgments, campus signs in both English and Anishinaabe, tuition waivers for all American Indian students. Given that I think all students ought to be tuition exempt, that's not any cost at all. The idea that we should respect our students' cultures no matter where they're from and awareness of the tragedy of our ancestors' colonialist confiscation of the land. I am more than willing to pay that. It's a cheap price to pay. But to the authors of the Merit Paper, this is not only too much, but that anyone who recognizes that history and trauma of racism is faking it. Here's one of the authors of that paper, McWhorter, exhibiting extreme insensitivity. He says, the notion seems to be that practitioners and scholars across disciplines must devote a considerable part of their time to putatively anti-racist initiatives. I have to say, no, it's not. It does not take up much time. Maybe it should, but it doesn't. It's a bold proposition, but given how shaky its actual justification is, all those dead people, centuries of slavery is shaky. Okay. It is reasonable to think that lately this devotion is being imposed by fiat as opposed to being an organic outpouring. And if the price for questioning that notion is to be seen as sitting somewhere on a spectrum ranging from retrogressive to racist, it is a price few are willing to pay. One is, rather, to pretend. What an asshole. Okay, I I guess anti-racists can't possibly be sincere. Truth is, we don't devote as much time to the subject as it deserves. Uh, I teach genetics, for instance, a subject with a long history of deplorable biases, And I spent one week of the semester on why racist genetics is wrong. Time which was also spent applying what they learned about the actual science of genetics to racist pseudoscience. None of this was imposed by fiat. There is no university requirement that every class must include an obligatory session of racism bashing. So yes, it was organic and voluntary. The idea that anyone who disagrees with your right-wing ideology is just pretending is grossly offensive and says more about McWhorter's belief than anything about me. Oh, you can't imagine someone being honestly anti-racist? Then screw you, McWhorter. One other thing. The idea that being on the CSJ side means you're anti-merit. That is bullshit. I still get yearly performance reviews where I'm asked about my teaching, my research, my service to the university. I, I sit through meetings where I am graded, basically, on my performance. And I have to submit all these forms summarizing my work to date. Nowhere on these forms is there a question about my identity. It's reduced to my social security number, if you must know. And nowhere is any administrator looking at me and saying, You're white, no raise for you this year. I also still give grades, but they're based on performance, not skin color. No one in this very liberal university is even suggesting that we stop assessment, even though that's a word that terrifies every professor because it involves paperwork. Okay, moving on. Let's see, where's the merit? So the Merit paper apparently had a struggle getting published and was rejected by many editors before review, the authors claim. Now, most of us, if we were trying to publish and editors kept bouncing it back at us and telling us that's unacceptable, we might stop and think, 
Maybe the problem was ourselves, not the editors. That's the whole point of publishing, isn't it? To get feedback from your peers about the quality of the work. Not to these clowns. They got rejected once by PNES, which has a 15% acceptance rate, so most people get rejected by PNAS. And they had decided a priori that, of course, their paper was meritorious, so therefore everyone else was wrong. How awkward. They had to resort to publishing in what was, at best, a fringe journal with the primary criterion of how controversial a paper was, rather than on its merits. And they tried to fluff it up with an op-ed on the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal, a disreputable cesspool of bad conservative nonsense. And they finally dumped it on the Journal of Controversial Ideas, which seems mostly to publish right-wing trash. Okay, they then wrote an afterword to this paper, calling it ironic. Perhaps the grandest irony of all, and the saddest commentary on the state of academia, is that this article, Defending Merit, could only be published in a journal devoted to airing controversial ideas. As we were finalizing the manuscript for publication, the Office of Science and Technology Policy of the White House released a 14-page long vision statement outlining the priorities for the U.S. STEM ecosystem. The word merit appears nowhere in the document. Wow. He got rejected once, and that means that the entirety of the scientific establishment was against you. Okay, consider this. Maybe just defending the magic word merit while only vaguely defining it and claiming that everyone who opposes racism is against merit was considered a non-meritorious article. It was bad, sloppy, and dishonest, and that's why it wasn't accepted. What they want is a kind of affirmative action to privilege papers that favor a conservative viewpoint. It is the height of hypocrisy to demand that everyone else must meet their high standards while waiving them for themselves. Speaking of dishonest, the White House vision statement, um, it actually, yeah, has the word excellence right there in the title. They might want to consider investing in a thesaurus or a dictionary over there in Wingnutia. Okay, but they continued. Um, they also wrote, the National Academy of Sciences released a report titled Advancing Anti-Racism, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in STEM Organizations Beyond Broadening Participation. Uh, the report describes, a merit, describes merit as a non-objective, culturally construed concept used to hide bias and, and perpetuate privilege, refers to objectivity and meritocracy in STEM as myths, and calls for merit-based metrics of evaluation to be dismantled. Everything is going to be dismantled, according to these guys. Uh, there's a hint of sour grapes here because the National Academy of Science article is 450 pages long. It's a, it's a book, not just, and it's published by multiple authors. Uh, I only skimmed it, but it was easy to find where Krylov and pals were misrepresenting the work. So here, for instance, is what NAS said about culturally construed, that pair of words that just damned it in the eyes of uh, the Krylov gang. So they wrote, conceptions of merit and excellence in doctoral admissions, for example, are not given or objective, but rather culturally constructed over time within disciplinary communities that have mostly been non-Hispanic, white, and mostly male. Thus, the metrics of merit and excellence that institutions privilege in admissions reproduce cohorts of students who resemble what came before. Uh, what is the objection to that? That is correct. The Krylov article also failed to give a conception of merit that was not culturally constructed. I find it hard to imagine a definition of merit that can say that one person is better than another 
that isn't thoroughly larded with subjective positions. But I have to emphasize that one point. Conceptions of merit and excellent excellence are not given or objective. That's the key issue here, and it's one the Kryloff paper glosses over and does not address. What is merit, if not a culturally constructed metric? It's right there in the final paper they cite. The fundamental problem they simply ignore writing a paper to defend merit without giving an objective, measurable de definition of this thing that they claim is impartial and objective and essential to science. By the way, the only places where the report uses the word dismantle is in references to dismantling racism, not merit-based metrics. Those aren't synonyms, although I suspect the authors think they are. One last thing from that NAS paper. NAS paper. Actually, it's the first thing, since it comes from the preface. So NAS says, this report provides no simple answers to racial obstacles that date back beyond the origins of American history. The authors, a consensus committee of experts appointed by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, were selected for their deep engagement on issues of anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. As such, we are well aware of the challenge in using evidence-based action to remedy unfair systems, structures, and institutions that advantage some and disadvantage others on the basis of race and ethnicity. Undaunted, we tackle our charge to identify racist and biased conditions that create systemic barriers and impede the full talent pool of our nation from pursuing and advancing STEM careers. This report recommends actionable strategies based on the scientific evidence reviewed herein and based on the lived experiences of practicing STEM scientists, engineers, and professionals. Keep in mind, this lengthy NAS report is one of the key examples used in the Kryloff paper to show that CSJ supporters are abandoning the liberal ideal of assessing evidence and warding a merit. But it's written by a consensus committee of experts in STEM and uses the scientific evidence to recommend actionable strategies. The Kryloff gang are hypocrites. If they were serious about the importance of evidence and merit, they would accept the conclusions of this work. Unless they're actually admitting that merit is a subjective ph phenomenon, that merit might mean one thing to the National Academy of Science and something altogether different to a group of self-appointed cranks who resent the whole idea of social justice. But that would completely undermine their whole paper. Well, I guess I should mention the terrible Wall Street Journal op-ed by Coyne and Kryloff. It's even worse because it distills the Kryloff paper into a shorter, more readable summary of their bad ideas in a way that will be read by many more people. Once again, it uses the word merit like a pointy, sharp knife, oblivious to the possibility that it's much more diffuse and not quite as crystalline as they imagine, while demonizing anyone who introduces values and greater concerns into the argument as people who hate science. So, they compare social justice advocates to Trofim Lysenko. Oh, man. This could only get published in a far right-wing journal. That's, um, anyway, the crux of our argument is simple, they say. Science that doesn't prioritize merit doesn't work. And substituting ideological dogma for quality is a shortcut to disaster. A prime example is Lysenkoism, the incursion of Marxist ideology into Soviet and Chinese agriculture in the mid-20th century. Begin in the 1930s, the USSR started and forced the untenable theories of Trofim Lysenko, a charlatan Russian agronomist who rejected, among other things, the existence of standard genetic inheritance. As scientists dissented, rejecting Lysenko's claims for lack of evidence, they were fired or sent to the gulag. Implementation of his theories in Soviet and later Chinese agriculture led to famines and the starvation of millions. Russian biology still hasn't recovered. Yeah, it was a terrible and deplorable episode in history. 
Yet, a wholesale and unhealthy incursion of ideology into science is occurring again, this time in the West. We see it in Progress's claim that scientific truths are malleable and subjective, similar to Lysenko's insistence that genetics was Western pseudoscience with no place in progressive Soviet agri agriculture. It is not at all similar. Uh, we see it when scientific truths, say the binary nature of sex, are either denied or distorted because they're politically repugnant. I guess Jerry Coyne reads minds just like McWhorter does. Anyway, this is absurd hyperbole. It's malicious and stupid. You can't equate a broad-based social justice movement to a single terrible man given great power by a tyrannical autocrat. No one is being sent off to a gulag. What we have is consensus among a large number of scientists that racism is wrong, that we cannot grow the scientific enterprise if we continue to discourage and exclude a significant proportion of the population. It's about opening the doors and welcoming more people into the work and about repudiating the bad ideas of the past, which is the only way to grow. I hate to break this to Coyne and Krylov, but one of the basic principles of science is that it is malleable. We don't possess absolute truths, but instead are constantly tr striving to reach the truth and that our, in our interpretations are subject to revision at all times. Those interpretations are necessarily subjective since they're formulated by human beings and shaped by context and history. We have so many examples of this truth from the history of science, such as race science, eugenics, the exclusion of women from science, and now this ongoing resistance to acknowledge past wrong. The virtue of science is that it adapts and corrects itself. The weakness of conservative thought is that it resists necessary change and always supports the status quo, no matter how fallacious it might be. It is Coyne and Krylov who are rejecting the evidence now. The National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine assembled a whole book by multiple qualified authors to present the evidence for systemic racism and its deleterious effects on science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. And these two jokers dismiss it out of hand because it didn't support their vague ideas about the magic of merit. They wrote a paper so bad that it couldn't be published anywhere except in a fringe journal full of crank conservative opinions. And now they're going to lecture us on merit and science and accuse everyone who disagrees with them of being Lysenkoists. I am going to agree with them on one thing, though. Letting ideology run roughshod over the data and evidence is wrong and bad and should be deplored. It's just too bad that the paper they wrote is oblivious to the extreme ideology that drives their own opinions. Okay, that's enough. That was seriously one of the worst papers I've ever read. And I read creationist drivel. It's just that the Krylov paper actually has some respectable authors attached to it, or at least formerly respectable authors. Their respectability is being greatly diminished by their association with the racist apologetics in this badly written paper. For a palate cleanser, I will leave you with my list of Patreon supporters. Yes, you can join too. It's at patreon.com slash pzmyers. And also with an example of the pleasures of cultural pluralism. As a Native American serving institution, many of our ceremonies are accompanied by a different kind of music, also a different kind of dance. All kinds of cultural interweavings go on here. So in addition to the traditional Elgar professional that we get at every graduation, uh, our recent commencement was graced with the honor song by the Northern Wood Singers. So I'll leave you with an excerpt from that.